This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Patrice Sharkey, and I'm the Artistic Director of ACE Open. I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on tonight is Ghana land. I wish to express respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship that Ghana people have with their traditional land. It feels important always, but especially in the context of tonight's lecture, to state that sovereignty was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening on behalf of ACE Open, the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre and Guildhouse for our presentation as part of Perspectives. Perspectives is a series of thought-provoking lectures inviting leading artists, makers and cultural thinkers to Adelaide to engage with compelling ideas currently shaping our world. Tonight, in our first lecture for 2021, we will hear from Hayley Miller-Baker, a cross-cultural research-driven contemporary artist who explores human experiences connected within memory and storytelling. Um, selected images from Haley's 2018 body of work, a series of unwarranted events, which I know Haley's going to touch on tonight, um, are featured in Ace Open's current exhibition, The Image is Not Nothing, Concrete Archives, a group exhibition that explores the ways in which acts of nuclear trauma, indigenous genocide and cultural erasure have been memorialised by artists and others. It's within this exhibition context that we've been able to bring Haley over to Adelaide and I'm thrilled that we have the perspective series to all learn more about her practice. Um, but I'd like now to introduce Hayley Miller-Baker. Hayley holds a Master of Fine Arts at RMIT from 2017 and has been selected for the John Fries Award in 2019 as one of the top eight young Australian artists for the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, Sydney's Primavera in 2018, and the Josephine Ulrich and Wynne Schubert Photography Award in 2018. She's also a previous um, finalist of the Ramsey Art Prize held here at the Art Gallery of South Australia and, as announced today, is also um, participating in 2021. So congratulations, Hayley. Um, she won the John and Margaret Baker Fellowship for the National Photography Prize in 2020, the Darabin Art Prize in 2019, and the Special Com Commendation Award in the Churchy National Emerging Art Prize in 2017. Her work has been exhibited nationally, including her first career survey at the University of Technology, Sydney, which is currently on, in Photo 21, International Festival of Photography in 2021, Tanandi Festival, Contemporary, Festival of Contemporary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art in 2019 and 2017, Yerimboy Festival in 2019 and 2017, the Sydney Festival 2018, Hobie and Ali 2017, and Ballarat International Photo Biennial 2017. That's a big, that's a lot in a few years, I must say. Um, but with, with that all said, can you please um, join me in welcoming Hayley to the stage? So my name is Hayley Miller-Baker, and I'm a First Nations Aboriginal woman. Um, my mum's family belongs to the Gunditjmara people in Victoria, which spans from about Warnable Way, close to the border of South Australia, and then up towards the Grampians. And my father, uh, he is from India, and his mum is Brazilian. So I'm quite a mixed bag. Um, yeah, so I'm a research-driven artist, and I examine uh, human experiences of time and memory. And from that, I create monochromatic uh, photographs which navigate experiences of remembering and misremembering in a visual representation. So I look at how recollections and historical accounts are often improvised and embellished. So I'll just talk a little bit about my practice as a whole. So the way that I work is I spend quite a bit of time researching um, anything in anything and nothing in particular, really. Sometimes it can take me up to a year to find something in research that really speaks to me in my time, like then and now, to be able to take that on and then work with it. There's a lot of times where um, I go back through my research 
and find something that I hadn't found before that speaks to me in that moment to then take that on and carry that story. So it's not always in my research, I think, yeah, I'm going to do that and just run with it because a lot of the time it's it's up to, you know, when is a good time to, to pick that up. So um, my nan used to tell me when... Um, I was younger to fully inform myself of everything. So when I take a story or a memory or an experience in my practice, to not just take it at face value, whether that is something that is, um, I guess, traumatic to me or my family or to, you know to other people, um, whether it's something that is what I think is true look at all angles of the story, look at everybody's perspectives, what's going on in the time, what is the time, what era is it in, what, what part of the land is it happening in to understand how everything, I guess, is coming to be for that story or that memory. And I guess through my research and that practice, learning to do that has given me a way to create my art without shoving it full of emotions. It's almost like a, um, like a bit of a healing practice through the research and coming to terms with things and just being really well informed. So I'm going to talk to you about, first of all, how I became a storyteller. And I think this kind of just came to me in the last couple of days because I consider myself a storyteller, and I always have, and from a really young age, I have created, like, on out of thin air, in the spur of the moment, the most ridiculous stories ever that um, my parents have, like, slapped me upside the head for, of, like, don't say that to people. That's not true. Um, so, yeah, so going back to my mum's family, she, her family has been situated in that area of Victoria for 65,000 years plus. So there is a wealth of knowledge and stories and passing down and whether that's stories that comes orally from my family or whether that's stories that is presented in the country through its change. Um, I have an abundance of stories from, from that heritage. Um, and part of that is documented, like I said, orally, but also um, quite lucky, I would say, in a terrible circumstance through the Aboriginal um, mission stations, which I believe South Australia has plenty as well. But um, in Victoria, I guess... The lucky thing of an unlucky situation with the missions is that everything became recorded from those missions. So where dates drop out, specifics of stories drop out, um, photographs, you know, because obviously back in those times, um, Aboriginal people were photographed for documentation, basically. But because of all of that, I do get to have records of my family that I wouldn't have had otherwise in that time. So those stories and those documents and everything form my research too. So there's that side of me, and then there is my dad's side, which, as I said, from India, and his mother is from Brazil. Um, so he's first generation Australian, and he is in this country making up his own way, I guess, because he's got nothing to go by before him. He is adopting the lands and the places that he goes by, you know, what he gets to make what's special to him and what he is connected to, which growing up I thought was pretty cool. There was, there's a lot of places in my mum's family, but getting to watch my dad make like on the spot memories and stories and connections with different places um, was pretty special. So going back to my storytelling, which I think I realized the other day, um, maybe not realized the other day, but basically my dad is a compulsive exaggerator. 
and I know that this is being filmed, so I'm not going to tell him to watch it. <laughs> um, he is a compulsive exaggerator, and I am not even kidding, like one inch. He makes up stories, but the truth factor in the stories are like, I mean, you can't even see them. <laughs> He's beyond exaggeration levels. So I guess with him being an exaggerator, my mum, another reason I will not tell my parents to watch this, my mum likes to twist stories. <laughs> she twists stories, and for an example, just a blanket example, you know, she, we will all be together, me and my sister, my mum and my dad and my brother, in a room, and she will say something outrageous like, did you just see your brother fly kick that wall? And we're all there like, what? No, like he's in conversation with us. Total makes up stories, and that's just what she does. And we're like, no, this is what happened. She's like, oh, no, and then, but we'll amp it up again. Like, no, it wasn't just a fly kick. This happened after it. And uh, you may think that that, you know, maybe she's got something going on in her mind, but no, that's just her. And that's just the way she's always been. She just loves to tell a story that is not true. Same as my dad. So I guess what I'm saying with these two these two stories of my loving parents is that growing up, and they've always been this way, it hasn't, hasn't heightened or lessened over time, and me and my sister have kind of had to learn when we listen to stories from my parents and we listen to one on one side and the other on the other side, where does the truth lie? Like, do we go with the exaggeration because we know he exaggerates, or do we go with the person who makes up stories, just full stop? So, you know, where does this truth lie? And so I guess from thinking about my parents the last couple of days of thinking how I became a storyteller in a really truthful way of how I became a storyteller, I think that that's it. I think that along the way of my childhood, I've just always been given, outside of the passing down of oral histories of our Aboriginal family and the migration stories and things like that, which are incredible stories, I've always had to find the truth in my household in these stories that I was told. So I think that that kind of flows through in my work. So what I wanted to talk about from here is um, I'm not sure if anybody is aware of the Significant Objects Project, um, which is it's a quite an interesting experiment. So it's an experiment by Rob Walker and Joshua Glenn, who wanted to see if they could resell super cheap junk that they had found on eBay and turn a significant profit by adding personal stories to the item descriptions. So, their hypothesis was that emotionally charged stories would increase the perceived value of each object and therefore they would make money back. And to conduct this experiment, they spent around $129 worth of on op shop items on eBay. For example, this ceramic horse head which they, I believe they picked up for 99 cents. Um, so, they, so they bought all of these really cheap junk um, knickknacks, and then they commissioned 200 writers to contribute stories to attach sentimental value to these items. So this horse bust was bought for 99 cents and resold for $63, which I think is super interesting. Um, and the author of this particular item made up a story about her father, who was a dopey drunk and was hazing exchange students in France during the 70s and his disturbing experience with a horse at the time of that hazing. So, like I said, totally false commission to add to these junk items to then resell them to see whether 
a story and a memory attached to an item makes it more valuable. Um, and so each item sold at the profit margin and overall brought in uh, $8,000 $8, combined. And that was just off $129 spent on eBay of op shop items. So the link between memory and stories is obviously tightly woven. And you can't understand a story without understanding the memory. And our evolution has gifted us with some interesting memory quirks, including our natural urge to preference a complete story over one where essential parts are missing. And I've only found out about this, this project um, in the last couple of months. This wasn't something that I had known beforehand uh, at the beginning of my practice, which to be honest, was not all that long ago anyway. Um, but I just, knowing that story and knowing that experiment, I think really aids my understanding in the way that memory works with storytelling. The backstory of how I ended up at photography, I am a painter that was trained in painting for nine years. And my undergraduate degree is in painting and my masters began in painting and only halfway through did it switch over to photography. At, under no circumstance do I consider myself a photographer. I, probably because I didn't train in it. I've always had cameras around me and my grandfather was a photographer but I don't consider myself a photographer and I also don't consider my work photography because I construct it. So I got to photography by inheriting my grandfather's archive. He did whatever the equivalent was of an undergrad bachelor in photography back in the 60s um, when universities, well the university that he went to was a men's college um, in Melbourne. So he took an abundance of photos, hundreds and hundreds of them, and midway through his degree that he was doing, he had some eye problems and had to go get surgeries, and anyway, his eyes didn't work that well after it, so he couldn't focus and couldn't use a dark room anymore. So he, he packed up his photographs, and that was the end of it. By the time that I was born, I had no idea that he had any interest in photography or that he took photos. So back in 2016, when I was doing my Masters of Fine Art, my nan called me and said, I'm cleaning out my cupboard. Do you want all of these boxes of uh, your grandfather's negatives and slides? And I'd been, I was still painting at that point. Um, and I would have, she said anything to me. If she said, do you want this old rat that he killed in a mousetrap? when he was like 17, I was, yes, of course, because he, he passed when I was 11, so. Anyway, I would have taken anything of his, but I was like, yes, for sure, I'm taking this, no other cousin can have them, they're mine. <laughs> and, and then when I was going through them, because it was all negatives, I, was, I just had my phone, and I downloaded a negative app that turns them into a positive, just to see what they were. And then I just decided on a whim, I'm gonna go and get 10 of these scanned up and see what happens. So I got 10 scanned up because slides are quite expensive to um, develop in Melbourne. It's about $10 each, so I spent about $100 on 10 pictures. And then took them home, um, they sent over the scans later that day and went from there. I was just playing with them on my computer and uh, my mind likes to work in multiple places at once, so while I've got projects uh, going on at one time, I'm also working elsewhere so I can sort of have a break between the two projects so I'm not fully consumed into one and lose track. So in between a painting project, because I was a painter and was painting at the time, I just decided to play with these on the computer. Um, and yeah, so I'm the captain now, which is uh, this work, which is a series of seven works, this one here included, was born from me playing around on my computer after inheriting those photographs. Um, the works were created in a way that 
dissolve any type of order um, and is, were meant to be seen as family snapshots. So I kept them true to form in their size at 20 by 20 centimetres, so quite small, um, and added only the smallest of details in there. Uh, this one, the girl on the roof and the eagle. And what I didn't want to do was make it look like a photograph. I want it to, to be awkward and so you could pick out what was going on in there. So the eagle shadow on the floor there, that is a representation of Bunjil, which is an indigenous um, creator in Victoria. Um, I'm not sure if there's any layover in Adelaide here, but a very significant being. And so the girl on the roof there, you can obviously tell that she is not two size at all. So by taking these photos and jumbling them around and putting in these weird little bits and pieces but keeping them to size, I was hoping that by doing that, people would look at that and think, okay, well, this is not, this isn't a memory, this isn't a snapshot in time, this is not real, what has been constructed here and what are the elements that have been put in, what is the story that is trying to be told here? And so my professional career of storytelling was born through these works. Um, so little bits and pieces that I've added in here are all cultural items um, with the dilly bags, the bunjil shadow, um, and there's quite a bit of shadowing through there. And I like to create my images so there is no one linear way to look at the work at all. So depending on what part of the image the audience chooses to focus on will lead them down a narrative that is guided by their own history, by their own knowledge, by their own experiences, by their own memory. So, I, yeah, I don't like to tell an audience how to look at my images exactly. It's, I leave it up to a, almost like a choose your own adventure with my work. So, from here with I'm the Captain now, this was the very first series that I ever made uh, using photographs. And it was about, at the end of creating these as well, was the last time that I painted. I have not painted since. So... Thinking about memory and those works with I'm the Captain now, my nan was very, very concerned that when I put those pictures out into the world, that people would think that they are real and that my mum and her sisters, who were in those photos, were really chasing around eels. They were really going down to the lake with eel traps. They were really on top of roofs, things like that. And um, it didn't take her too long to realise that People weren't going to believe those things. But it got me thinking about how I can use memory to bring, to, not to bring truth to the surface, but how I can play with memory as an idea to mess around with truth and where truth may lay within stories, within history. So... Um, the action of exploiting memories for the purpose of storytelling is often done without conscious thoughts. Memories, when created, are subjective to their beholder and when recited are adjusted according to their audience. And that was something that I was learning about as my nan was telling me, don't put these out, people are going to believe that those things are real. Me thinking that it was really funny that I'm messing around with history and changing my mum's childhood... Um, in, in, I mean, because back in the 60s, you know, things are quite proper back then. You don't, you don't mess around in photos because back then photos were very expensive. So with all that in my mind of thinking about subjective memories and who they belong to, I want to talk about this series of work which is called a series of unwarranted events, which at the moment is showing at Ace Open. Um, this, this series was created, I want to say, midway through the beginning of my photographic 
art career, which doesn't really make sense. So it was 2018, so it was two years on from I'm the Captain now. And this series of work is about frontier violence and massacres that happened to my people, the Gundijamara people in Victoria. And the idea came about to make these stories was not to correct history or correct stories that were already out there, but to research and explore where common truths meet in stories. And so I had been passed down these stories of these particular massacres um, that I have talked about and created works for. I'm only going to put one up because I don't need to go through the massacre stories, but just for an example, um, this one here is the murdering flats and basically um, when white settlement happened in Portland, Victoria, um, a lot of the food resources were pushed out of the area and so Aboriginal people would have to go and steal from um, different, I guess, homes of white people because they had no food. So they had taken flour um, because they knew how to make patty cakes with the flour and on one occasion, this particular occasion, it happened many times, um, the person had figured out that their flour was getting stolen and swapped the flour with arsenic. And so it wiped out this entire mob. Um, but basically, without getting into the traumas of it all, I was researching the colonial journals and the colonial diaries and reading how they wrote about these events and because everything had to be documented at that period of time in Australia, because there was the breeding out initiatives of the Aboriginal people on the missions, they wanted to document everything that was happening, how many Aboriginal people were being killed, bred out, etc. because the plan was by a certain date that no Aboriginal people would exist. Um, and that would be the late 1800s. They didn't want Aboriginal people in Victoria to exist. So the way that they wrote about these stories in their journals, which are now made public to anyone in state libraries, um, you can even find them on the internet, these journals, but basically the way that they had written them was leaving out particular names of people who orchestrated these events, leaving out um, particular nasty details. It was almost like they knew that people in the future were going to be looking back at these stories and they wanted to hide their tracks, basically. They weren't denying that these things had happened, but they were also covering for themselves. So with this, with this project, this series of works, for me, it was about meeting in the middle of an agreement that these things did happen, a responsibility from the colonial side, but also a respect and remembrance on the Aboriginal side. So again, for me, finding the truth and where the truth laid for both parties in this history and how both parties want to remember these particular stories and how they've constructed that memory for future was very, very interesting to me. So, this quote here, children constantly are encountering other versions of the past. Different versions can arise unwittingly when conversational partners misremember what happened, but it can also occur when they purposefully exaggerate and even fabricate details to tell, say, a more glamorous account which would be my father. Given that memory is, a con is constructive, it is within this realm that bits and pieces of the suggestions and stories told by others may find their way into children's recollections of their experiences of a single memory, and that evolves each time it is remembered. And its new alterations form a new truth to its beholder, consequently becoming an unreliable memory or a broken memory. So with all this in mind, finishing that project of I'm, of, sorry, um, a series of unwarranted events, I was pregnant at the time of making that and having finished it and putting it out into the world, 
I felt that I needed to keep that, at, you know, my responsibility there was finished and I needed to push on from that. And so I started to look at, instead of historical accounts in Australia, to look within myself and reconsider my childhood memories and my childhood experiences and stories to see where my truth lays in these stories. And in doing that, I actually don't know if any of my childhood was real or not because some really outrageous things happened in my childhood. And I don't know if it's true or not, but um, so I'll, I'll tell a little bit of a story. So my cousins and I started doing this prior to a couple of deaths that were upcoming in our family. Um, there were a couple of people sick, including my grandfather that was going to pass. And I don't know how we learned how to do it. I don't know who told us, but we were taught at about 10 years old how to communicate with the deceased through playing with spoons and making homemade Ouija boards. It's the most terrible idea ever, and I do not know who taught us how to do those. So we would make these communications in my bedroom with candles lit, the curtains closed and all lights off. This is me, my sister, and two of my older cousins, not much older than me, a year or two older than me. Um, so we were all equally as responsible in this doing. Um, and I was really sure that nothing came of these experiments because the house that I was living in at the time 100% still think that that house was haunted. And so I didn't think that anything happened. But in that house, taps would turn on in the middle of the night, the fridge would open in the middle of the night with everybody asleep, um, light switches would click, and shadow people would be seen standing outside my bedroom door. The feeling of people touching my shoulders from behind, the hairs on my body standing up when I would walk into a room, radios turning on and off, and my whole family experienced this but in different ways. So for me, that is a very true memory. But then looking back after researching so much into childhood memories, I actually have no idea how much of that is true. So this quote here is by Andy Butler, who I commissioned to write on my newest body of work, I Will Survive, which I'm going to go into now. Um, and he says, I Will Survive overlays a past, present, and future into one image and offers us our own dark and meditative mirror to consider how the fundamental memories we hold are always shifting and will continue to shape who we will become. So that said, that memory that I just shared with you is one of my earliest memories um, in that sort of realm of weird stuff happening in my life. Um, and that has for sure shaped me and the way that I remember things. So going on from there, I want to read this short piece of writing that I wrote about I Will Survive, and it touches on my childhood memories. And... I wrote, a memory changes whenever it is remembered and its revision becomes a new truth. The truth is I will survive isn't the truth, but maybe it is. The action of exploiting memories for the purpose of storytelling is often done without conscious thought. Memories, when created, are subjective to their beholder. I'm recalling these memories formed in my childhood and ruminating on these stories as an adult, I can't help but dissect my memories, influences and influences. What roles did my Aboriginal and migrant parents and grandparents play in feeding me these lessons? I can tell you that when I was a child in these moments, this was my honest truth. Now that I am older, I'm sure that it was the truth, but then again, I cannot be sure. I've been taunted and haunted by ghosts, spirits, and the paranormal. Maybe I misplaced the noises and voices, and my mind planted a memory decorated and exaggerated, amplified by fright, but maybe not. I've heard growls and howls and snarls of predators watching and waiting, ready to attack. Maybe I was simply spooked by a trusted elder with a did you hear that and did you see that, embedding awareness and alarm to keep me from straying too far from the pack. But again, maybe not. 
I've confronted and endured such unruly terrains that are naturally ready to sweep me away with the blink of an eye. Maybe it was my ancestors guiding my next footsteps towards safety and survival, deeply unconnected to my existence while presenting as luck, but then maybe not. Through my predecessors' gifts of warnings and dangers and instructions to keep safe, I've ducked and dodged the deadly and out of this world. Considering that cons the constructive nature of memory making, I'm sure my recollections have loosened and shifted over times, each retelling, reshaping their truths, once overlooked moments and at times embellished. The truth is, I will survive is the truth, but maybe it isn't. So this is my new series of work that, that uh, I made last year during COVID and was presented this year in 2021, uh, in February for photo 2021. Um, and this is all about my childhood memories. So with all of that research that I've just shared with you and my personal stories of my parents and the way that they tell stories and the way that I've looked at stories that have been written and orally passed down to me and where that truth lays, I really wanted to move on into my own personal space and look at where maybe I had lost the truth in my own stories and whether my experiences were authentic or whether as a child me retelling them to you know, if something happened, me running up to my parents or my cousins, depending who I'm telling it to, and really exaggerating that story because I wanted to get a bit of hype out of it. Um, yeah, so in these works here, these are all my childhood stories. I spent a lot of time with my family from the ages of about three years old to 14 years old um, down in the bush camping, proper camping in a tent with a shovel to go to the toilet where you wouldn't see anybody else for about two weeks, um, bathing in, in rivers or dams or whatever was around to bathe in. And yeah, this is where I guess the most of my memories come from was being out in the bush. So within this work, I look at memory in the way of these stories that I was told of bush witches, of giant sharks, mega sharks, of black panthers that were brought over to Australia, apparently from America during the war to be a mascot. Has anyone else heard of those stories? Yeah, my, my mum is absolutely obsessed with those stories. And she even once tried to write a book. She's a journalist um, and a writer. She tried to write a book about these big cats. Um, and then I won't tell her to watch this again. But anyway, I read it. And I was just like, no one's going to believe this. And she stopped writing it. So, um, so uh, the storytelling runs thick in our family. But she was so obsessed with these big cats and had sworn that she had seen them and had been keeping up with the clippings in the news of these big cats between the Blue Mountains and Victoria. And I swear that I have heard them, but I don't know if that's just because I've listened to like a good 30 years of my mum telling me that I've heard them and that she's heard them and that she's seen them. And so, yeah, it, th those stories made it into these works. And when we were out bush, um, more stories that my dad would tell me. And remember, I have to remember and note that he is first generation Australian. So he is making up his own stories as he goes. And so he's a little bit more outrageous than mums of big cats that are a possibility. But his ones... Um, came to me after the Blair Witch Project was released. And I was about, I think, eight years old at the time, and he chose to tell me the story of the Blair Witch Project the weekend before we were going out camping for a week. And, and I'd already had all these weird things happen to me as a child of like laying in bed and my radio turning on full blast or like opening my eyes and there's a shadow in my doorway. So he's telling me of this Blair Witch Project 
And I don't even think at that point, my mum recently told me that he hadn't even seen the movie. <laughs> he, he had watched the ads on TV and was relaying that to me. Before we go out camping, like I said, there's no, it's not like a camping ground and caravan park. This was camping. When it's dark, it's dark. That's it. You can build a fire, but that's it. And we were in a single tent, me, my sister, my mum and dad, and um, yeah, the Blair Witch. And I'd wake up in the night and say, Dad, I really have to pee. And he'd be like, are you sure? Like, the Blair Witch is out there. And I was like, no, absolutely don't need to pee anymore. Like, I'll wait. I will wait. And so this idea of, like, these bush witches, which, you know, I think I've seen and I think I've heard, but thinking about at the time of these, you know, when did I think that I first heard the bush witches out there? It's around the time that my dad told me about the Blair Witch. So, I mean, how much of it is true? And I really have to look back at my memory and think you know, what, what have I made up in my head and what is really true? More stories that go into these works are my nan. She had a farm back in my childhood and she had a dam. Um, and she told us as children, me and all my cousins who would visit the dam, we loved, my pa built this dam to farm trout. He's a retired Air Force man. I don't know what his job was. Um, but anyway, he bought this farm and he was a real handyman and wanted to get all these animals and chickens and farm trout. And he made these two whopping huge dams. And as children, we wanted to go and play in the dam because it's a big body of water and we love big bodies of water to play in. So my nan told us, and once again, I'm not the only person in my family who believes this is the truth because I was not the only one who's seen it. All of my cousins saw it and they all have their stories. Nan had a crocodile and she kept it at the bottom of the dam and it would come out during the day. But if we wanted to go and play at the dam, we couldn't go there by ourselves because we would be eaten and that would be the end of us. That was it, goners. And so if we wanted to play in the dam, we had to give her however long that she saw fit to go down, to catch the crocodile, to lock it up, and then we were okay to go there, but she had to stay with us in case it got out. And it's obviously not the truth, but me and my cousins have seen a crocodile in that dam many times. We've seen the crocodile. It was there, and we lived to tell the tale. So these bodies of work here, this body of work, I Will Survive, talks about these stories that were passed down to me for the purpose of staying alive and for staying safe. But my memory has done some really weird things and made all of these stories become a truth. And so through this body of work, I've really looked into where that truth lies and I play the victim and the protagonist in this series and there's no real one way to look at who I'm playing. I play the past, the present, the future. I play the paranormal. I play reality. I play me now as I am. I play me in time lapse. Um, there's all of these different versions that I have brought to the surface in these stories to be able to show in a visual way that any given truth is a truth. There is no one truth. And depending how you look at a story or a memory or an experience, there are, there's no one way to look at it. There's a thousand different ways. So for me, when I look at this, I have my way that I look at it because I built it, but then everybody here is going to look at it in a different way. People might see different victims in here and different protagonists. People might see whatever it is. And so this body of work really looks at how memory 
can be distorted so much over time that the truth loses itself pretty much fully and becomes a reality for whoever is living it. And I think that that is a really cool idea if you really think about it. Because I'm research-based, I mean, I've got like a wealth of knowledge in my head to back all of this up. So I don't want to confuse anyone by just giving snippets of different things, but I hope everybody is on, on track with what I'm saying. I haven't confused anyone. So 30 years into my life, I've had some pretty interesting paranormal experiences. And if you're a skeptic and don't believe me, you can ask any of my cousins why they have stopped having sleepovers with me. <laughs> this story starts in my 28th year and is a result of my husband becoming privy to my weird spirit attracting history. My most recent, which was a good couple of years ago before I finish this story, my cousin was sleeping over with me. Um, I believe she had gone through a little bit of a breakup with her longtime boyfriend. So I was like, come over, come stay with me. And that was the last time she stayed with me because all night, I kid you not, my computer, which was in the room that we were staying in, right, right next to us, so it was like I could reach out and touch it. My computer, the keyboard and the mouse was going all night, clicking and typing. And it was disgusting. Anyway, she won't sleep over with me anymore. Um, so my husband, uh, we, were, we were back on my country and I was taking him through all these childhood places in the research leading up to this body of work here while I was photographing bits and pieces. And it's definitely quiet there. There's no animal sounds, no nothing. It's just so... So quiet, really quiet, and all, just to give a visual, all the tree trunks are black. I am not on top of my tree species, but there's a tree trunk that are bl that's black. Anyway, um, and we're walking through there, and it honestly feels like you are being watched and you're being followed the whole way. And this leads into my bush ghost theory. My husband felt it too. And as we were trekking through the bushland that I grew up in to make way for the water, which I was trying to photograph, my husband says to me, this is Lady in Black territory. The Lady in Black is his on-the-spot creation that is about a bush witch who runs as fast as you can, but you can never get a good glimpse of her, but she watches your every move and she could absolutely get you if she wants to. And so through that moment of my husband embedding his experience and his story into my memory of that landscape, this lady was born. And she enters my, my memory making. So I'm not going to go into any more stories from there because I could honestly go on forever and ever and ever. But I want to leave with this quote the link between memory and stories is tightly woven. You can understand story without understanding memory. Our evolution has gifted us with some interesting memory quirks, including our natural urge to preference a complete story over one where essential parts are missing. And I like to make stories on memories where essential parts are missing. And I think that I will leave it there. Thank you so much, Haley. It's a um, really personal account yeah. of big ideas around memory, storytelling, multi-generational time, and yeah, validity of truth is um, kind of core to it. Um, it's maybe more of a comment to start us off, but it's, um, it's interesting to see in a very short period of these bodies of work going from the family archive to like history on country um, to childhood recollections and then into the psychic realm even. It's kind of interesting kind of the back and then forward and yeah. Have you, have you reflected on that kind of journey you've taken through the image making? I think that, um, well I, yeah, I started with my mum's, um, my mum's memory and then sort of went forward to my nan and then great grandmothers. And I think that for me, what I know the very best is my experiences and my stories. So I guess everything beforehand and learning 
how to story tell through my inherited stories gave me the confidence to really go for it with my stories. Yeah. Um, and maybe one thing we haven't touched on that I think would be good for the audience is the, the, how, how do you construct these images? Like, how, how, yeah, how do, um, I know we talked about the archive and the family archive, mm. but then you've gone, you have gone on to country or gone on, gone on and, and, po and in the last series we see you as a model, so it'd be good to talk a little bit about how the final images come together. Yeah, so basically with my work, uh, what I was saying at the start is I don't consider myself a photographer. Even though I take the images, most of the images in my work, my earlier works, um, I'm the captain now that I showed you first, is all of my grandfather's photographs. But I find that the best way for me to bend time and to bend truths and to make sure that what I'm showing is solely based on a story, experience, memory, is to construct it the same way that your memory constructs itself. So what I end up with is what I think and what I experience of when somebody's telling you a story and they're giving you all the details, and it may not be all the details, maybe bits and pieces, but when your mind is making up that visual representation in your head so you can follow, and I'm, I just assume that everybody's brains do that, make up a visual for when you're getting told a story. Um, yeah, so the way that I make my work is I go out and I photograph according to the story, so for the, the massacre works, I travel back to country, which for me, I live just on the outskirts of Melbourne. So it's a four, five hour drive, depending which way I go, to take all of the images of all the individual things, for example, trees, rocks, flowers, bodies of water, animals, whatever it may be that I wanna use for my images. So I take all of those photos, from every sort of angle, every sort of variation that I can get, take it back home to my computer, download thousands of images, and they're the digital ones. I shoot everything mostly on film, but I do back up with digital in case film doesn't work out because I can't travel back four hours to take it again. So there's two lots. So there's the film and then there's the digital. And so once I've downloaded all of those onto my computer, I sit for a good couple of months and cut out every image that I think that I might use. So, um, you know, a rock, I, I blow it up huge and then I cut it out and make it into almost what looks like a sticker. So I, I refer to them as stickers um, on my computer. And so over time I've built this really big archive of stickers so when I'm making a work, when I need something, even if I haven't used it for something else, when I took the image, if I need to use a tree, I can go to my tree folder and I have a whole bunch of them there. And so from there, I drag the image out into Photoshop and I start to rearrange everything. And it can be from anywhere between, um, I'm the captain now, the first body that I made, between three and eight layers unwarranted events, which is at Ace Open, is 300 images plus in each work. Um, and then I will survive. I decided to step back and refine what I was doing, mostly because it was very, very exhausting doing it the way that I was doing it, even though it was coming out really cool. Um, but it was, it's just so much work. So I decided to step into a studio, introduce myself as the character, um, so all the portraits were taken in a studio and then the backgrounds and the images are just straight photographs and normally for me I construct the environment because I don't want it to, I don't want, I want people to take enough information that they can place it in their memory and connect it to a story in their memory. I don't want people to be able to point out, okay, yes, that's that place, I've been there and you know, it's just what the images that I choose for my work are highly suggestive, but not enough to give a full picture. And so the way that I make the work of constructing it that way takes away, I guess, just being handed the story as it is. You have to search bits and pieces for it, what's been added, what's not been added, you know, what shadows and light are clashing. Um, yeah. 
I must say, even just now, looking at the photos, like I've seen the work before, but um, projected, there, there, there are so many layers and these just kind of disconnects that, you know, as memory works, you just, you keep picking up on things that you thought were there, but then you can see that they're placed in front. Um, but, and I guess, it's sh yeah, shadow and kind of doubling, even I was talking to you about your um, choice of um, headshot and this sort of like ghostliness seems to be um, an important part of creating the image as well. Or the, the conceptually around this sort of shadow space or um, lack of completeness. Would that be accurate? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I definitely don't in my work want to hand over all of the information. It's really important for me that people are left with considering themselves, whether it's a past, present, future, whether it's an alternate reality, whether it's um, a totally false account, where the perspective is coming from, that is all up to the viewer and whatever they find in the image to guide them into that story, you know, that is also dependent on their prior experience as well. Um, it's, a, it's a wild departure from painting as well. <laughs> do, you, do you think you'll continue down this line now that you've... Yeah, yeah. you see yourself going next? So I think with, with painting... Um, I, I just, I'm really, really handsy with my making. Um, and so painting for me, uh, I just, oh, my nan taught me how to paint when I was in the bush, when I was like five years old. She paints landscapes, really, really beautiful landscapes. And so that was, I guess that's just where I picked it up at five. And then I remember in prep, the teacher asked us what we wanted to be when we were older. And I was like, well, I'm an artist already. So that's, this is what I'm going to do. Um, but, but, yeah, no, I was, I was five. <laughs> the sass. Um, yeah, but then, but then as my painting progressed and my education in painting progressed, I ended up in my final years of painting, and I'm sure I'll go back at some point, but I was painting monochromatic paintings. And I think that was because... I had a lot to say, but at that point in my life, after finishing high school and, um, I mean, to put it, like, just straightforward, like, there was quite a bit of racism. And so all of the stories that I did have related in one way or another, because I'm an Aboriginal person, to my Aboriginality, and I guess that I was just really worried of the reaction and that I just didn't want to have to deal with certain reactions from friends until an advisor at, during um, my master's said, well, are they your friends then? And I was like, what a silly thing to say. Of course they're not. My friends don't do that. So then from that moment, and that, that was the same time that I um, got handed over those the archive from my grandfather, and it was just a bit of a turn, and I was having fun with it. And even though it's a big departure, for me, in my mind, I had been like saving up all of those stories and I had so much to say but didn't know how to confidently convey it. And so in the end, I was just painting black, which for me, when I talked about it to other people, I was talking about the history of monochromatic paintings and the history of paintings, but in reality, it was kind of like a void where, you know, I'm just screaming out all of these things but couldn't figure out how to do it until I got handed them. And then it just all flowed from there. That was like what I needed in that moment, in that time, and aided me to be able to start to tell all of these stories that I have and that we have in my family. When I got the archive, that was mid-2016, I had my first daughter at the start of 2018, but I'm a big believer in collecting family archives, like always have been. Um, a, a lot of my research is all family research of putting pieces together to have full stories of people of not just, you know, they were born here, they died here, they lived here, things like that of completing a whole story and so that they're passed down in my family. And that's mostly because up until my nan, nobody in my family lived past the age of 40 
But these stories that should have been passed down were just sort of like scattered everywhere because everyone's parents, you know, no one in my family was older than 10 years old by the time that both of their parents had passed. And then my nan is now 79. Um, and it was just really important for me to know that. And I want full stories for my children. Um, and I think that it's really, really important. When I made a series of unwarranted events in 2018, I was pregnant through that whole process of reading about these traumas and, and um, violences and massacres and things like that. But for my children and for other people, I just... Like, like I said before, I'm not, I'm not filling gaps and I'm not trying to correct histories and put truths out there, but I do want them to take all of these sort of things as an inheritance and that's their story. So it is important. They're not going to like I Will Survive, though. They're not going to like hearing about... Like Maeve said some really weird things about ghost things the other day. And I shut that down straight away. I was like, you're not taking on that part of me. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure, like, yeah, it's absolutely important. And with motherhood, I have a role to be able to pass these things down. Might <laughs> leave it there. Um, if you can just all um, join me in thanking Hayley for her talk tonight.